The best player on our Little League team refuses to play until he has his own official cop baseball card. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Spark Bridge Sports History. And in this episode, I'd like to celebrate 70 years of topped baseball cards. Uh, Howard Fredericks and I were talking this week, or actually emailing back and forth. He found a great story. I was unaware of it, even being a, a, a big card collector, that this is the 70th year consecutively of Topps publishing baseball cards. And of course, uh, when, the irony of it all, when I went on their official Topps website, they really didn't make a big deal of the fact that they've been in the business of selling baseball cards for 70 years. Now, they've also done, obviously, basketball, football, and hockey cards as well, and an array of uh, cards from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, like uh, I remember the Batman uh, card series, I think the Star Wars series was all about them, or they published all those. So numerous different series of cards based on movies, television shows, and uh, obviously sports. So today, I'd like to just kind of focus on all things baseball cards, but I don't have really a rhyme or reason. These are just some of the cards that when I went on the web, uh, and just kind of punched in. I just got an array of cards and I thought, all right, I'll just I'll print this one out. I'll print this one out and we'll talk about some of the players. I did deliberately go uh, later on and get maybe certain players. You'll see in a second who I'm talking about. But I just figured I'd start with their very first year and that's 1951, according to Tops. And do you realize I did know this because... Uh, long time ago, and I will feature this on a future episode, the baseball, the great baseball card collecting, bubblegum collecting card book. And it was done in about 1974. And basically, the authors of that did the same thing that I'm doing actually each week here, presenting some cards, uh, providing some nostalgia and some stories about the players. But this was obviously a book. They really had some funny funny anecdotes about the players. Really a great trip back in nostalgia growing up in the 50s as a kid, in the 60s as a kid. And for a kid uh, who grew up in the late 60s, early 70s, many of the stories they talk about getting packs of bubblegum cards down at the Five and Dime or the general store really resonated with me, especially on those hot summer days when you go down deliberately getting your next set of baseball cards and you'd stop for a soda. And on the way back, uh, you'd open up your cards. And of course, the smell of the bubblegum card on top of the card, really, really, you can still uh, smell it to this day. Now, of course, the bubblegum was stale, but we always chewed it. But it started as a wad. And then within about five minutes, it lost its taste and either you swallowed it or what we used to do was just shoot it out and try to aim for a gutter or a sewer and try to shoot it down there. But actually, people didn't realize this. What came first, the bubble gum or the baseball cards? And it was actually the bubble gum because Topps was a chewing gum confectionery uh, company. And in order to really enhance sales and really grow the bubblegum, they in, inserted baseball cards. But over the years, it's the baseball cards that have had the long lasting flavor, especially with baseball card collecting fans. So I'd like to show you one of the original cards and it's a little, a little faded. And I, I didn't realize until after I, I, you know, printed it, this is Ferris Fane, and we'll talk a little bit about Ferris Fane. But this is a 1951 baseball card from the top set. But it's not technically a baseball card like we, we think of as we see this 1955 Charlie Bishop, uh, a pitcher for the Kansas City A's. This one actually was a game that you used to play. So it was almost kind of like playing Uno or a deck of cards, and you'd collect the cards, and then, you, you know, um, you would have – the uh, cards and you would follow what the cards did for you. 
Now, this one says foul ball. Now, we used to play it this way because they had later versions of this game. You used to put the cards on top, and if it was a foul ball or a strike, we would just say foul ball out or strike just to move the game along so that it wouldn't um, necessarily be impeded by all the foul balls or strikes. How, 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 how it's no different from today when we're playing sandlot in the back. You foul the ball into a neighbor's yard, you're out. If you strike on the first or second pitch, sometimes we would just say that's a strikeout. We wouldn't go for three pitches for a strikeout or continuous foul balls into the neighbor's yard. You foul it out, you foul it out. Anyway, that's Ferris Fane. And, you know, for a lot of old baseball uh, card aficionados and baseball fans in general, I know that Ferris Fane had some really good seasons. In fact, I'm just going to list them here. Fane actually finishes with a 27 war. He's actually a two-time batting title winner and a five-time all-star. Kind of weird in that he really had a very compressed uh, career. He gets off at the age of 26. Without a doubt, I'm sure 1947, he probably served military duty in the Army or in the Navy. And so he gets off at, at a late start, age 26. You know, the great Hall of Famers, if you take a look at them, they're in the big leagues by the age of 20, 21, sometimes in, in the teenage. And then they just uh, amass just an unbelievable, let's say, 18 to 20 uh, odd year career. I'm thinking of Johnny Bench, who came up at 19, or Willie Mays, who came up just a few months past 20 years old. Uh, other players, I believe that Ted Williams, who we'll get into a little bit today, also came up as a teenager because in 1941, he was only 22 or 23 when he hit 400. So you're talking, he, uh, maybe he was up two years. So you're talking 21. Okay, 21 years old. Anyway, Fane. In the nine years, makes the All-Star team five years, and he did play for some lousy teams. The Philadelphia A's, we talked about them last week. Although that Philadelphia A's team in 1947 wasn't too bad in, in context of their franchise. Remember, uh, or if you recall, I think they finished over 500 because we were talking about the Canadian pitcher, uh, Marchandon, who uh, had a pretty good year that year. Remember, they were 78 and 76 and uh, they had on that team Phil Marchandon, uh, who was a 17-game winner or a 19-game winner. So that wasn't a bad team. But Ferris Fane was a first baseman for those uh, Philadelphia A's. He really compiled a 290 batting average lifetime, led the league at age 30 and 31 in 1951 and 52 with the A's, he only played 117 games the one year that he qualified for the batting top, but he hit 344. He had an on-base percentage of 451 and uh, not a big hitter. In fact, in all his years in the major leagues, he only had one season where he was double digits. Kind of like if you remember a guy when I was growing up, Wes Parker, who's probably his greatest season was 1970 when he had 10 home runs and 110 RBIs for the Dodgers playing first base. But Fane was more of a kind of a punch and Judy hitter. Uh, he amassed 43 doubles in the second year when he led the league in hitting with 327. Not a big RBI guy, but he drew a ton of walks. In fact, he would be a valuable player today just getting on base. You'd probably see a – Kind of in the realm of like uh, Joey Votto was a few years ago. He was just drawing a ton of walks, hitting in the second and sometimes uh, leadoff and third position for the Reds. But get this. He drew over 100 walks five times in his career. That's amazing with another year of 80 walks during his prime. So he wound up with a 290 batting average, just 48 home runs. So you're talking about a guy that baseball referenced, and they are the uh, website I do use probably about 90% of the time. But his overall 162-game schedule, and remember they only played 154 then, would be seven homers, 80 RBIs, and a 290 batting average. Not too bad. Uh, played, as I said, nine years. Wound up with Cleveland in his final year. Just kept missing getting to the postseason. Played with the White Sox a couple of years before, 
uh, they win the pennant in 1959 and was on the White Sox instead of Cleveland in 1954. <laughs> so he just missed out. Charlie Bishop is another player. I, I, I'm just going to talk about him. And I just wanted to just say this. Uh, he finishes with a negative 0.8 war, uh, 10 and 22 lifetime, 533 ERA. But at least he's got a baseball card, just like that little leaguer said in the cartoon today. And this is from 1955. What I did punch in, I, I just put in, I, I did about every five years or tried to do every five years just to give uh, a sense of development in the card, maybe a sense of uh, nostalgia for, for fans because, you know, you start collecting at sev seven, you kind of finish as a kid collecting by 12, 13 years old. And then that gets ready for another set of uh, card collectors. So Charlie Bishop <laughs> pitched for the A's. He actually got in pretty pretty amazing. He actually got four years in with the A's. He was with them when they moved to Kansas City. He finished with a 10-22 and 22 mark, but at least he's got four years in the major leagues. He pitched um, a 5.33 ERA. Probably his most important season was his worst, and that was 1953. He actually went 3-14 and 14 with a 5.60 ERA. He actually pitched 160 innings. So I – you kind of, and I didn't do the homework on this, but probably in that 1953 season, the A's probably just threw him out there. Maybe they saw something in him, maybe not. Uh, but it seems like he was thrown out there as an innings eaters in many lopsided games and all the rest of it. Although he does that year start 20 games. So maybe they thought they had something there. It just never materialized. Another guy I have up here, Dale Long. And He's kind of interesting because I remember him. If you are a Don Mattingly fan, you'll know it in about 1987. He was actually on a splurge of hitting home runs in consecutive nights. And the guy he was shooting for was Dale Long. He had the record for eight consecutive games of hitting at least a home run. But I didn't realize this when I was looking him up. And I did use uh, another source for this. Uh, I believe it was Wikipedia. Dale Long actually was the first player during the 1950s. So you're talking about 50 years of baseball who became, he was like the first left-handed catcher in about 50 years in the major leagues. Remember, 99.9% .9 of our catchers, even today, are right-handed throwers. Why? Most batters are right-handed. It's an easier toss to second because you're on the inside of the bag instead of the out. And uh, it's just one of those things. It's like why most first basemen are lefty uh, throwers and righty glove men because of the stretch. It's much easier. You know, baseball is one of those sports where whichever arm dominates, they, they find a spot for you, then, which is why lefty pitchers are so valuable. And in fact, I got to tell you this, um, Charlie Bishop was a righty. I was going to say, hey, maybe if it was a lefty, I can understand why they gave him 20 starts with a 3-14 and 14 mark. Anyway, Charlie Bishop. I just liked it. I do want to point out, this is 1955 I put in. Look at all of the kind of how dressed up it is. You got the logo, uh, the player in action. And then a headshot with usually the baseball uh, hat on, and you can see the logo of the team so well. Even the Dale Long one, Cubby logo down here, the Cubby hat, him in uh, position or in action. Then I want to get to two guys, one of whom I did grow up with, and that was Norm Cash. Never realizing, I always just associated Norm Cash with the Tigers. And the one year I really do remember uh, – Cash playing with the Tigers was 1971 when he, he cracked 33 home runs, had one of his better years with the Tigers. I think he hit 325. In fact, I, I can get that for us right now. But, um, yeah, he cracked 377 home runs, 271 batting average. He has actually a 54 war. Not bad. Now, I don't think it's going to make him into the hall, although – Here's the interesting thing. Like Ferris Fane, 
he did get quite a few MVP votes in a number of years. In fact, he was in the MVP top 15 three times and in the top 35 five times. So, uh, or six times rather, because he finished 33rd and 31 in 19. 65 and again in 1962. But what I recall the most about him is this. I always thought he was a really good player as a kid growing up. In fact, with Detroit, he averaged with Detroit over 25 home runs for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight straight years. Now I know Briggs Stadium slash Tiger Stadium was a uh, hitter's delight, but still, 377 home runs during the dead ball era of the second half of the 20th century, which is what we why we have the DH today. That was the 1960s. If you recall, uh, 1968, probably the pinnacle year of just the dead ball era in, in baseball. When I say dead ball, it was just uh, pitching. I just so overcome the hitting, even though ironically, in 1961, you have not one but two players hit 60 or more home runs. Pretty amazing. But generally speaking, the 1960s, we lower the uh, the mound in 1969. We uh, even add more offense via the DH in 1973. And, of course, uh, that's been with us and won't be going away. In fact, the National League used it last year as well. So, all these things tried to, in, in baseball, tried to really encourage hitting. And that's why I point out 377 home runs is not bad, is, is pretty good total for a first baseman who played basically 17 years. Played for the White Sox, then was traded to Detroit. He was on the 68 Detroit team. And people will forget this. But he finished fourth in the MVP in 1961. Why? He hit 361 in 1961. Actually led the league in on-base percentage with a 487 mark. Ready for this? He drew 124 walks in 1961, Norm Cash. And, of course, people do remember that Cash, I do believe, later on admits that he kind of used a loaded bat. Uh, to hit 361. In fact, the following year, his batting average drops over 100 points. He hit 243, yet still kept his home runs up. Actually, his greatest season was 61. 41 homers, 132 RBIs, 124 walks, and the 361 batting average. The next year, he was 39-89, 243, but, but drew 104 walks. And, of course, we know how valuable they are. And I guess I'm really off on a pension about walks because for the last two nights I've watched Moneyball for a couple of times. And we'll do something about that. But, obviously, the whole gist of uh, assembling a team there is to make sure you get on base via a hit or, more importantly, a walk. I bet you that if you asked many of those Oakland front office, they would say probably today – the walk might be more important than the hit simply because a walk uh, really goes deeper into a pitcher's count. And, of course, we all know that the pitching count is – I'm surprised it's not in some in some parks that it's not even put up on, on the board. Uh, it, that has become uh, part of the equation of the effectiveness of a pitcher. How many pitches has he thrown? Well, if you can draw four or five walks in five innings – you know, you're talking about an extra 20 pitches that you've you've forced maybe that pitcher to throw. Anyway, uh, Norm Cash, and for, uh, unfortunately, you know, Cash, uh, I believe, had a tragic death. You know, he I believe he drowned uh, when he went fishing in one of the Great Lakes uh, at a very young age. Yeah, he died in 1986, Beaver Island, Michigan. I believe he drowned. Uh, fell out of his boat, obviously, and uh, drowned. Age 52, Norm Cash. But this picture is, I believe, from 1960. Why do I say that? Either 60 or 61, because he has a Chicago uh, outfit on, and he might even have, yeah, it was just right before he is traded to Detroit. In fact, 
Uh, this might be 61 because, or the 61 season prior to it because you can see it, it lists that he's playing for Detroit, even though that's a White Sox uniform. Here is a guy that was probably the Jim Bouton of his time. It's amazing how similar both pitchers are. His name was Jim Browsman, JB, Jim Bouton, JB. And, of course, I've read both books that they are probably most famous for. Of course, I'm talking about Bowden's Ball 4 and Jim Brosnan's The Long Season. Never realizing this, I read it many years ago, the uh, Jim Brosnan's. It's a little um, less Hollywood than Bowden's. And I think that's why Bowden's is the more popular book because it's almost like uh, – you know, People Magazine goes uh, goes into the locker room or National Choir invades the Yankee locker room because Bounton does uh, release a lot of locker room information, especially about Mickey Mantle uh, and some of the, uh, the crazy stunts and antics that those Yankee ball clubs did of the 1960s. But both are pitchers. I think Brosnan was a starter who is then sent to the bullpen, just like Bowden. Both struggle, I would say, with just staying on with a ball club. Both do, I believe, play for pennant winners because Brosnan, I think, was traded to Cincinnati in the middle of that 59 season, just like Bowden is in ball four. And, yeah, he is. He does pitch or get into or is part of that 61 pennant winning Reds team. In fact, he was an MVP 20th, 20th uh, for the MVP as in 1961, he went 10 and four. He had 16 saves. In fact, here's the deal with him. He was mostly a, uh, a starter then turned reliever because he had a number of games. Uh, in, in fact, in 1958, he started 20 games uh, as a starter for the Cardinals. Uh, and the Cubs, and then, of course, gets traded to the Reds and becomes basically a relief pitcher. Well, Bowden did the same, and in fact, I think I do have a picture of Bowden. Yes, I do. I have a picture right over here of Jim Bowden on a team that didn't exist, and that is the 1970 Seattle Pilots, as you recall, right before the season began, because I did a tribute to Ball for the book, uh, the Pilots moved to Milwaukee. So these, in a way, I bet you if you talk to collectors, they might be very valuable cards. But here's Jim Bouton. Um, and here is Jim Brosnan, both authors of great baseball books. And in fact, the interesting thing I was reading about Brosnan is that he is traded to a number of teams, finishes with the White Sox. And the White Sox Bill Vex said, we kind of had enough of this inside, uh, you know, we're going to bear all our secrets to the public. We want our locker rooms to be quiet and so that players feel comfortable, uh, yada, yada, yada. So he put into his contract, Brosnan's, stating that he couldn't write anymore. Uh, probably anything sports related. At least that's what I read. And Brosnan, rather than sign the contract, walked away from baseball at least as an active player, because he does go into broadcasting and all the rest of it. So it's interesting how Brazen and even Bout went into broadcasting because for years, remember, he worked for CBS as a sports reporter. So you're talking about two guys, very similar, almost around the same time because Brazen, of course, finished up 1963. Bouton's record, they kind of cross over in the sixties. And, but that was more of Brosnan coming down in his career. And of course, uh, Bouton having some years of success with the Yankees and his career is going to finish about 1970 and then come, um, to fruition again with the Braves in 1980, I think, because that was the essence of that, uh, another installment, uh, to ball four when he makes it back to the major leagues with the Braves still throwing the knuckleball. But those are two guys, Brosnan and Brosnan, like Bouton, didn't always see eye to eye. In fact, Soli Hamas 
was his manager with the Cardinals. And I know just from reading that Brosnan talks about uh, certain political issues, uh, certain social issues, and he kind of butted heads with the manager of that team, Solly Hamas. And it wasn't just always on baseball. I'm talking about other locker room uh, issues and all the rest of it. So it's an interesting read, The Longest Season. I always, I did enjoy it. Obviously, though, I don't think it – here's the difference between the two. I think Bowton was smart enough to have really, really, really funny stories in his. Brosnan was really a perspective uh, type of piece in, in terms of he was – I would say it, it, it's it's more serious about the issues of baseball. There aren't as many funny anecdotes, as many funny stories in Brosnan. It's it's very, um, it really is almost like a historical <laughs> report on being in those locker rooms in baseball. I, I think that Bouton probably was aware of the longest and said, you know what, the long summer or long season rather, and said, we got to put a couple more funny uh, components in the book. And of course, if you ask anybody who's read both, I guarantee you that they probably read ball four uh, many, many more times than Brosnan's work. All right. I did kind of bring this up. Here they are. Now that's Al Kaline, 1965, Frank Robinson in 1965. Mickey Mantle baseball card, 1965. Now, the reason why I bring this up is that even though Robinson is in a red uniform, he will be traded over the winter. And I was thinking this, all right, you have those players as your outfield in the American League. And maybe you can argue you Stremsky, but remember Yaz, 1965, 1966, he's got about four or five years in. These guys are well-established stars, K-Line, Robbins, because they go back to the 50s and, of course, Mickey Mantle. Now, would you take that outfield, minus Bouton, everybody, please, or would you take this outfield? I don't think there would be an argument. You know, that's why the National League won so often and so many times during the 60s, they really um, they really uh, scouted for African-American players and Latin players. And if you take a look at the rosters, the National League had a plethora of great black superstars. Every team had not just one or two, two, three, four great players. And these are the three, I would say, Back in 1966, even though these are 1965 cards, you put those three in the same outfield. Amazing. Amazing. Just, just hits alone. You got three guys with over 9,000 hits. Batting titles alone. You got guys, uh, I, I think they amassed six or seven batting titles total. Home runs. You got two guys with over 1,300 total. And another one, Roberto, I think think he finishes, I want to say, I'm going to say with maybe about 300. I forget how many Roberto has offhand, all right? But you're talking about 1,000 home runs, almost 10,000 hits, and the gold gloves. They have more gloves. I, I, I mean... They, they have more gloves than, you know, a sporting goods store, gold gloves. I mean, you're talking about Roberto Clemente, seen as Bob Clemente here with the Pittsburgh Pirates, uh, the Atlanta Braves, Hank Aaron, and, of course, Willie Mays of the Giants. And I always think about this. You know, there are certain players, I don't know what's better, Hank or Henry Aaron, but Willie Mays could never be William Mays. And, of course, they do – uh, change Bob Clemente to his more natural, his real name, Roberto Clemente. I mean, that's how I grew up uh, 
following Roberto Clemente. I used to love his little hitch, his little leg kick. It was so unique. And the fact that he could hit anything, he was kind of like the Yogi Berra. You could throw it in, in the dirt uh, and have 62 bounces and he could still put it out to right field on the wall on a laser line drive for a double or maybe even a triple. But Hank, Hank Aaron, yeah, it's impressive. Henry Aaron, man, it's just, a, and he was actually called both. It is interesting. You know, Frank Robinson was seen as Frank Robinson, not Frankie Robinson. But yet, it's Mickey Mantle. And Al Kaline, I'm not sure whether he was Albert or Alvin, but he was always Al Kaline. Right? Not the battery. Al Kaline, the ball player. I, I have, I, I kind of wanted to save this, but I couldn't resist. I mean, I, you know what it was? Last week we did the D-Day. And I don't know whether I had mentioned it on the broadcast, but I was doing research because I wanted to see what the what baseball was doing on D-Day. And I don't know whether I had mentioned it, but real quick, baseball didn't play on that Monday or Tuesday, June 5th or June 6th, 1944. So then I thought maybe they knew something. So then I went back through the baseball reference and I found – there was only one other month that year, I do believe, May, where they didn't play the Monday or Tuesday. They probably did it for to save uh, gasoline expenses and traveling and all the rest of it. But they do play in July because, let's face it, July 4th, it's a big weekend for baseball. And August 4th or August 5th and 6th and September 5th and 6th, uh, they do play on those. But they didn't play that Monday or Tuesday of D-Day. And I always thought that was, I, I still think that's kind of interesting because I'm thinking, did baseball know something? Did Dwight Eisenhower kind of mention them? Now, of course, I don't know when the actual uh, schedules were made up. So we'll never know. But I think it was probably done more as a way of saving uh, transportation gas and all the rest of it. Now, um, so I didn't, getting back, I didn't want to forget this. I mean, that's some outfield. Look at that. Clemente in right, Mays in center, and you'd put Aaron in left. And the only reason I would switch Aaron from right to left is because Clemente probably had, well, that would be interesting. Who had the better arm, Mays or Clemente? And I wouldn't know. I'd, I'd really love to talk to some scouts about that. I would probably say, well, they probably would say Clemente. But I'm not sure. That would be interesting. But then again, you're saying Mays was just the embodiment of the five-tool player. You know, Clemente, probably a four-plus, if you really want to know, because he's more of a line drive hitter than power hitter. Okay? Um, next guy's up. And I had mentioned them before. I was looking at this. This is a whole group of cards. And, of course, the one who I really wanted to highlight was Louis Aparicio. Why? Louis, I remember as being a Chicago White Sox and then later in his career, a Boston Red Sox, never realizing that he played with the old Orioles. And of course, Aparicio is probably seen as the greatest or one of the finest defensive shortstops of all time. I just wanted to go through this real quick if I can find him. Uh, Louis Aparicio, I remember him. I couldn't believe this. And I'm looking at Aparicio as, and I'm looking at it through the lens of today's ball players. And you're saying, could Louis Aparicio play in today's ball ball game? And the only reason I say that is that he hit 262 lifetime, but his on base percentage was 311. So it's not like he's drawing 100 walks. In fact, his high was 66 walks in 1969. So you're talking about probably what we used to say in the old days, a very free-swinging player. Uh, didn't draw a lot of walks, so he went up to the plate to swing. But Aparicio led the league from the time he was a rookie, 1956, at the age of 22. He led the league nine consecutive years in steals with a high of 57 in 1964. Um, sacrifice hits. In case you want to know, he led the league twice, once with 20 and another time with 14 his rookie of the year. He is a rookie of the year in 1956. He does draw 
enough MVP votes to finish in the top 25. His high as an MVP was uh, 1959 with the Go-Go Sox. He finished right behind Nelly Fox. Fox was one, and uh, Aparicio was number two. So he goes from the White Sox to Baltimore. He does play on the Baltimore team of 66. So you're talking about a guy who played on two pennant winners and one World Series champ. Uh, in fact, he starts his string of gold gloves when he's 24 years old with the White Sox and won gold gloves. This is Aparicio right here, just in case. And, you know, I'm going to keep this up. I'm not going to get to all the players, but it's just great to see these. Aparicio won one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine gold gloves. And he won five consecutively. And in fact, in 63, I'm trying to think who might have been the gold glove winner there. I don't think it was Fregosi, but it might have been. And then, of course, he is traded to the White Sox after the 1967 season because they have a future gold glove winner there coming in and being inserted in those great Oriole teams of the early uh, 70s, uh, Mark Belanger. And then, of course, he has 1970. He started the All-Star game. That's how I do remember him and finished actually 12th in the MVP. And then in 1972, this is pretty amazing. He goes to the Red Sox, kind of like that late deal, because the Red Sox acquire him. I think they acquired him over the winter of 1970-71. He plays for the uh, Red Sox in 71. 72, of course, everyone remembers this. We had the baseball strike. And as a result of that, one of the conditions of coming back from the strike was that none of the games would be made up. And here's how it hurt. The Red Sox lost by half a game to the Tigers. I think the Red Sox played, I'm going to say, 156. And the Tigers won, uh, played 157. And the Tigers, on the last week of the season, defeat the, the uh, Red Sox. And in one of the games, a big loss. It might have been in the second to last game of the year. Aparicio is coming around third, and I believe he slipped and was tagged out at home, thus ending the chances for the Red Sox winning the uh, the American League East that year. They'd have to wait another couple seasons with the Gold Dust Twins of Rice and Lynn to win the East 1975 and then again to win the pennant in 75 and then lose that classic world series to the Reds in seven. But Aparicio didn't realize this starts with the White Sox, goes to Baltimore, goes back to the White Sox and then finishes his career with the uh, Red Sox played 18 years. Here's what drives me crazy about his career. You're telling me that the Red Sox didn't know this. He played 132 games in 1973. To finish with his career, you know how many games he played in his career? 2,599. You're telling me that the Red Sox couldn't find uh, another chance to put him in a game, either as a defensive replacement, a pinch runner, a pinch hitter, or just, hey, I'm coming in here in the ninth inning and to replace. Not only that, the Red Sox don't even give him 500 at bats. He ends his career with 499 at bats in 1973 and he was still productive he had 271 with a 324 on base percentage they're both higher than his career averages right he had 17 doubles okay one triple no homers 49 rbis for a guy with no power by the time he was 39 he still had a pretty good you know season to the point where you know guys should be keeping these stats and saying we got to get him in the game just get him 500 at bats, you know? I mean, this is kind of crazy. All right. Have some other cards here. I want to bring these guys up only because they are famous in a way. Norm Miller played about 11 years or nine years with mostly with the Astros. He finished up his career with the Astros, with the Braves. But why I remember him most is that, um, he was one of Bouton's roommates on that 1969. As I, I said just before, you know, Bouton didn't finish 
that season with Seattle. He gets traded from a last place club who never wanted to use him as a starter. They were too afraid, even though they were mired in last place. And he goes to a team, the Astros, with all of this baggage. And the Astros are like, hey, do you think you can start with your knuckleball? And Bounce says, yeah, I'd love to. He says, but I'm only throwing knuckleballs. And this is a team in the midst of a pennant. You know, the Astros, I think that was the first year they finished at 500 in their franchise. They were they finished the season 81 and 81. But when they acquire uh, Bowden, they're in the pennant race in the, Amer in the National League West, along with the Reds, the Dodgers, the Giants. And the Braves, who eventually win it. I think the Dodgers are, uh, I think they actually finished under 500, but let's just say it was just those four teams. And then, of course, it's the Astros who have, they have Wilson and they have Durker. And they were hoping with, with Bouton that with two fireballers, now Bouton would really mess with the heads of the hitters. And in fact, as Bouton says, he pitched eight innings against the Pirates with Clemente and Stargell, all those great hitters that they had. And held him nothing, nothing, I believe, and then actually loses the game on a couple of miscues by the Astros. But he felt that he, he felt uh, that he had really done his job, and he did. And the Astro management was very happy with him. Harry Walker, uh, I think, pitches him again, whatever. But it's just the interesting thing that he finishes with a team in the playoffs. All right, and the last guy I want to talk about is this. I found a guy, Tommy Davis. Look at the number of cards he is on. And we'll talk about maybe Tommy Davis in a future episode because I do have other things. Maybe what I'll do is I'll continue with the top celebration of 70 cards next year, uh, next week because I do have some other things for Father's Day. And this will be a nice segue from 70 years of uh, Topps baseball cards to – the perfect game spun by Jim Bunning against the Mets on Father's Day, 1964. So for everyone at Park Ridge Sports History, I'd like to thank Howard Fredericks for giving me the idea for the Tops celebrating their 70, uh, 70 years of baseball card production. And I'd also like the guys who made it, who made it also fun, the ballplayers themselves. This is Willow Tool for Park Ridge Sports. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great week, and I'll see you next week with another edition.